I came to London in 1991. Uh, I just finished college, and um, uh, I got um, a place in Battersea, uh, near where I got my first job, and I lived there uh, briefly. And when I first went to Brixton, it was to go, go and get music. So I went to Red Records in Brixton. So basically, I went to all the record shops over London because uh, I was very into music and into DJing. And uh, yeah, I was very into this kind of uh, American house sound and into uh, soca, uh, jazz, uh, hip hop, rare groove, funk, all, all these kind of um, genres, uh, which actually people were into it, were into all these things at the time. So uh, I was into the jazz dance scene and I, I used to go and do jazz dancing in, in uh, suits with wide lapels and, and button caps and do the splits and pirouettes and that kind of thing. And, uh, and then there was rave culture as well, which was very alive. And uh, Brixton was a very uh, vibrant, artistic... Um, you had the Cool Tan Centre where you had um, kind of trance kids, which was not a scene I was into. Uh, but that's where you had the, the white rasters and, and kind of uh, uh, people who, who were like taking on the culture probably in a very narrow-minded way as well. And uh, yeah, that was part of the scene. So you had Krusties, uh, you had like B-Boys, you, you had uh, rasters, you had... I don't know, the music scene was just very alive and... Um, yeah, my buying music, I used to buy in Black of Dread in Cold Harbor Lane for the reggae, and then Red Records, that was where I could get bits of the American garage I wanted to get, and hip-hop and R&B, and then in the market you could get soca and African, and, uh, which was all I was, amazing music I was hearing everywhere that I really loved, because I, I loved dancing, and, uh, and I loved black and Latin music, and uh, I say black music because black music is very wide from Nigeria to Ghana to Jamaica to Antigua, you know, and to Brazil and all over. So, so many little uh, genres. I mean, also there's, there was a big Brazilian community in Brixton. Around that time, I started to do parties at Taco Joe's, the, the first... Yeah, that was, I just met Simon with, uh, and we'd sorted out the name Basement Jackson. I said, well, that's a good name, so we haven't got any music out. And I said, but maybe I'll, I'll call the parties Basement Jacks. And then anyone who used to come to DJ, I'd kind of make up elaborate names so that it looked kind of more exciting and happening, like the flyers that I'd seen. And uh, so it was all quite imaginary, really. And it was, um, and that, yeah, initially that was, um, friends of mine from university, posh white girls, and then crackheads off the street who would all come. They'd love meeting each other. The crackheads love the posh girls, and the posh girls love the crackheads. So it was a great cultural exchange. And, uh, and it, it meant that it was very alive and, I don't know, just uh, and, and different from kind of a, a formalised going out and club culture. There was a, it was all friendly. We, you know, you had a nice guy in the door. It was all good vibes and about treating the general public and, and making it as cheap as possible for everyone to have a nice night. And making, for me, the music was my main focus and uh, to make sure the music was as pure and real and good and underground as possible. And that, that was the first Basement Jacks Nights and then they went from there to uh, the crypt, which was under St. Matthew's Church, uh, up to George IV, at Brixton Hill, and then the Telegraph at Brixton Hill, then St. Matthew's Church. Uh, that's when it got a bit bigger. And the Junction in Loughborough Junction. And uh, they were the main venues, so kept moving. I don't know why. And actually ended up here, uh, the last party I did in Brixton, which was called Inside Out. And uh, yeah, so that was, I don't know, about eight years ago or something. That's a wide guess. <laughs> I have no idea. But, and I was playing here just recently, actually. Here in the jazz? Yeah, yeah. How many people were involved in, in putting these nights on? Like, what, kind of how, how did that sort of community that existed in Brixton, or maybe it was people that were coming in from outside with you, how did all those people come together to put this thing on? Because I think that the way the Basement Jacks nights are remembered, it's, it's you and Simon. 
Well, the, the nights were, um, it was, um, I was doing the music, and that was my thing, and my friend Fiona, her job was to get people there, and that was it. And uh, yeah, in our works, we got all the, um, got the flyers printed and did everything at cheekily at lunch times when the like grabbed the photocopier and got a load through and just cut them up and that was the flyers. I always designed them myself and just chopped up bits of paper and and um and then we'd go around the local pubs and then we'd put the flyers, the Duke of Edinburgh and uh, up around Brixton basically on the and put posters up around Brixton as well. Uh, and then go as far as Clapham and to Streatham, just kind of in the surrounding area. Um, uh, yeah, and there was my friend Alma, who's quite tough. She's a Streatham girl, and uh, she was the one who did the door. That was her job, and because uh, she kind of knew the territory well, and she she liked the glamour of it, I think, and liked saying no to people <laughs> if they were too drunk or whatever. And from the beginning, the whole policy was to treat everyone the same. I mean, there was no fame, and basement jacks didn't even exist. And actually, the first parties were called. Um, Bambino Mio and Sorelli Spaghetti. And I'd used different names and we did a boat party and we did this and that. But and then Basement Jacks, I thought, I want to do the really true New Yorky thing and, and make the music really good. Even though some of my friends weren't that bothered about that music and some of them would love to have heard some trance and stuff like that. But I didn't allow it because I was doing the music. And uh, yeah, so, so basically, yeah, Fiona, uh, she was... Fiona Florence, she was responsible for getting people there because she was she's quite kind of a, a people person and, and very kind of a, a a bit of a socialite and really good fun. And uh, so she was in charge of getting people there, which basically started off being people's mates from around the area. And uh, she worked in a uh, she used to get all the lot from the jewelry warehouse. They all came down, and uh, actually one of the first Basement Jacks songs was the the girl that were in her work in the office, she used to sing around the office. And uh, yeah, so it, the whole process of the Basement Jack thing was very organic anyway. Uh, that was the nature of it. It was like basically anyone I met in my extended circle. And uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's about it. But actually the policy of the first club night was uh, was the second room was house, and then the little uh, bar area, which is tiny, that also the, the DJs there were girls as well. So to make sure, because music was a very male-dominated area, and, uh, and the girls thought it'd be cool to DJ, and I was like, well, that's good. That's kind of, you know, a good energy and a good vibe for the, for the whole night. And uh, so they played R&B and, and jazz and, and soul and stuff like that. So they all, I mean, none of them were DJs, but they DJed, yeah. The parties were for friends because they were the only people I knew. It was like anyone I knew. If I met anyone, it was like, do you want to come to the party? It wasn't, it, it wasn't like some great big social network. I mean, the first parties, I don't know, maybe 40 people. And then, like, and then it used to be like 100 people. That'd be it. And it'd be amazing. <laughs> so was I bringing anything else to Brixton? Uh, I mean, at, at the time, the, there wasn't probably the self-awareness that there is now with young people about what we're doing, is it cool or whatever. There was, there was no checking whether it was good or, or anyone was interested because no one was interested. It was just a party with a few friends and, and people who came in off the street and if they liked it, we were like, we're doing it next month, come then. And uh, yeah, there was no... I mean, that was before the days of Twitter and whatever. All I did was put, yeah, drop it off at tables at pubs and then send it to Time Out and try and get them to put it in the club section that this was a club that was happening. And, uh, but basically, it was only a, a party for friends. And it was, yeah, I mean, it went on for quite a long time before we became hit. I mean, that happened probably in, like, 98 or 99, a, a long, so that was kind of six years later. And uh, yeah, then suddenly, the, it was a very visible chain, uh, change, because um, yeah, that was when we got to Loughborough Junction and there were people for like 500 meters round the block going up Cold Harbor Lane. You know, very middle class, groovy, 
uh, hipster kids who were obviously into fashion and were standing there kind of looking a bit terrified because they were out uh, and really excited because they were, you know, they were discovering Brixton. And, uh, yeah, but that was a time when I thought, OK, I need to stop this because this is becoming, like, popularity has come its way and, and people into fashion and, and, I don't know, the new hip thing, they'll swallow it and spit it out. And I didn't... I wanted it to... It was amazing parties for years. And because it was real people, you'd have... When we were at the Georgia Fourth, you'd have the old West Indian men playing pool at the bar. And it's great, you know. It's, it wasn't like you were kind of imposing your will on a situation. You went to the situation and you lived with it and, and brought something to it. So, um, which is, I, I think... I know sometimes people in Brixton are wary of that and people in many areas when someone comes in and buys something and, and just changes it all without thinking of the people who live there and what their story is. And it's their home. You're going into their, their home and their neighbourhood. So it's kind of... Yeah, I think it's always showing some kind of respect for what has come before and, uh, yeah, but, and doing your own thing. Well, I, I think when I first came to London, I was looking for a place that, that felt as kind of comfortable for me growing up in the Midlands. And, uh, yeah, just... I wanted to be in a, a normal community where people were friendly. That was my main consideration. And, uh, and Brixton was friendly because I lived up Brixton Hill. And I really liked it up there because people seemed to, normal. You, you know, you had... Every, you had toddlers, you had grandmas, and you had every kind of type of person getting on with their lives. And uh, so that's it. All you want in life is to be around nice people and who show warmth and, and kind of care about their neighbours and, and want to live out their lives, whatever they do, whether they're in high fashion, they're a funeral director, or it, it really doesn't matter. Mm. And um, how did that progression take place from presumably you would have to have done kind of far fewer parties at that point when you started travelling around and that kind of thing? Did, did it stop or did you kind of maintain that connection for it to keep coming back for it to really? Uh, well, I mean, throughout all the... Yeah, I mean, the, the whole... All the Basement Jacks albums, they were all based around here because the studio was in Camberwell at the beginning and then ended up at Loughborough Junction. So um, that was until 2012, I think, yeah. So, so yeah, it's, the studio's always been kind of in and around there. Well, people always have said, yeah, but you're in Brixton. We were like, no, no, we're in Camberwell. That's where the studio is. And I lived in Brixton, uh, um, and Simon lived in Ballon. So it's kind of, he wasn't far. And... Um, but probably the, the Brixton thing and the parties, that was my thing. And, and yeah, people like Fiona who made it happen. I mean, the, the first one's Taco Joe's. That was really like just any restaurant that's not been done up. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was a bit like a community hall. or um, And it, it was in an arch under the railway. And, um, yeah, it was, it was just a, a place. <laughs> and uh, he used to clear the restaurant tables away. And it was just a very homemade place. And, and um, Taco Joe, I saw him a few years ago, but he's now living out in the Caribbean somewhere. Um, but it was his place, and he put his heart and soul in and, you know, put little flowers on the table and just made it a homely place. Where uh, that? So now that's the Brixton Bar and Grill, I think, uh, which is on Atlantic Road, yeah. And um, uh, after that... Yeah, the crypt. I used to get this guy. After that, I upgraded the sound system, and, and a guy from Essex used to come, 
who had function one, which was like the, the most exciting sound system that people didn't have at the time. So he used to drive up and then put these eight speakers like this big all along the wall at the crypt. And they're far too loud for the whole place. And uh, it was like, it was an amazing sound system uh, in this little place. And it was just, and I, it was probably three quid to get in or whatever. So, but it had to be a balance between the cost of getting the system in. Because it wasn't about making money. There was a, a couple of hundred quid made or whatever. And because it, it was fun to do. And it was, yeah, it was a chance to play the music. And uh, I mean, also at this time, it wasn't like, what I was doing was presenting some completely new spin. Maybe it was a bit, uh, but there was this whole scene, there was like American house scene that had come to London and I was totally into it. And they used to play, they had a show on Choice FM that they used to play on Saturday night and um, where you could hear the New York DJs. And then they started coming in the um, mid nineties to the Ministry of Sound and that opened. So Ministry of Sound at the beginning was a place you couldn't, they had no alcohol, which was like the, the clubs in, um, that it was based on in America. Because uh, it was about just dancing and all the music was about unity, it was about pureness of spirit. Um, it came from Chicago and Detroit and New York and it was very, very black, very multicultural, very Latin as well. And, uh, but I think... I mean, the reason house music first came to the UK, I think, is the spirit of it is, um, was really strong and really real and about really people at the fringes of society and, um, and it was their voice. But it was about taking a positive spin on it, about lift every voice and sing. And, uh, if you listen to the house music a cappella, it goes, you may be black, you may be white, you may be Jew, you may be Gentile, it doesn't matter in our house. So that was a whole kind of mindset. And also at the time in hip hop culture, there were people like Public Enemy. So uh, I remember doing a, um, a boat party and arriving next to Westminster at the end of the, the night. And um, I can't remember how long that had gone on for, but and then playing Fight the Power in the, the boat next to Westminster. And, it, uh, and then playing Love is in the Air. So it was a time of like, about demonstrating the voice of the people, but also doing it with love and with a positive spin. And uh, in the music culture at the time, that was really alive. And I guess anything in the Basement Jacks nights was mirroring that and this kind of underground house scene that was very much in the States, but wasn't happening in the UK except for like the Ministry of Sound and a, a couple of places. Because I used to go, when I didn't get records in Brixton, I'd go um, to Black Market Records in the West End, and there I'd try and get a song that I heard on this show on Choice FM. And uh, they'd only have like two or three records. So there were only three copies of the song that, and uh, yeah, I used to get one and it was a really precious thing and then you'd play it at the place and it was all making things special. And uh, yeah. Uh, but also, as Basement Jack's Nights went on, it was always there's no guest list, no one's going to be treated differently, and uh, yeah, it's um, and later on that got more of a problem because people like saying, But I'm important, and I have, and it was like, and Alma, who was on the door, was like, <laughs> and she is really tough. And then people used to say, God, the girl on the door is so tough, but she had her policy and knew, and uh. And she didn't like it when it started getting really hip and because all the hipsters thought that they knew what was what and were, she was like, she knew what was what. I mean, music and dance culture was just very alive and there was all this, I mean, Acid House had happened and there was this whole scene of music. There was, productions were really good and exciting and all the American records and yeah, so I, I was very much into that. And Brixton was very much on the map of, of that, I guess. But it was underground culture and, uh, yeah, artistic culture, multicultural culture. And, uh, yeah, it wasn't the mainstream of what's happening in the, the country. Uh, just recently, I was talking to the guy from um, Gorgon City and saying they've been over to America. 
and the and the American uh, journalists were saying, "Oh, this, this garage music that you you made, you and Disclosure and people is like." There were people in America making that in 91 and 92. And that's the records I was really excited about. That's a long time ago. And, uh, and it really annoys me when I'm in America that they don't give enough credit to all the, the people from uh, New York, Chicago, and these various places who created all this sound. And, uh, and now it's been whitified, and, you know, which, is, which is always weird kind of talking here, talking about you know, colour or whatever, because we, we shouldn't really be doing it. We should just get beyond colour. And, I mean, in my life and everything I deal with, yeah, I mean, colour, let's... Every colour, every possible permutation of every colour is, is what existence is. So, um, and we get very caught up on these tags, and I've been using them myself in this interview. But, yeah. Yeah. So I suppose initially with the, the parties, part of it was fighting against the labels that everyone put on things. Exactly. You know, so uh, I, I was a kid born in Leicester. I was very into Latin music. I was very into African music because I liked dancing. And um, yeah, it wasn't, I, it didn't make sense. And, uh, but I don't know, Brixton, the, the joy of it, there were people from all over the world, you know, um, Portugal, Spain, Italians as well. I mean, there's, there were Europeans and, yeah, every shade. And that was, that was cool and interesting. It, wasn't a, it was about being inclusive and not one thing. Brixton definitely massively influenced the music, the Basement Jacks music, because, yeah, just every day, Right, going off to the studio, going through Cold Harbor Lane, hearing like some calypso, hearing some uh, hard dub, hearing some jungle, just coming out of cars, out of doorways, and um, yeah, it was it was just everywhere, and and not only the music. I mean, probably more than the music was just the uh, the confrontation of kind of cultures smashing together and kind of. Uh, friction and um yeah and friction always gives life it's kind of when people don't talk about things that's when it, it gets all very staid and people don't feel they're expressing themselves and uh yeah brixton was totally about expressing yourself and and everyone was expressing themselves right <laughs> up to everyone else so at times that you know there was it kicked off and uh and probably the, the aggression and the violence, that probably came in the music as well. And, yeah, just the kind of kaleidoscope of, of sound and, and kind of vision and everything. And a lot of the songs and albums and um, there's so many references to things in Brixton or, mm. um, or club nights. And, um, is that something that you were consciously doing or was it just something that just sort of felt right at the time that you were surrounded by these things and kind of the names just sort of fitted? Uh, I mean, generally, with the whole path, not a lot of it was consciously done. It was more kind of one step at a time. And, um, our, yeah, well, the track uh, that we did at the beginning, I think we called that Banana Crew. And that, but that was earlier on, and um, that's when we had the studio in Camberwell. And that, we did a song, I live in Camberwell, she lives in Brixton. And that was just because... Uh, we could hear some sub somewhere going, and I live in Canberra. Well, she lives in Brixton, and uh, yeah. So I mean, things like that happened, and so it became part of it. But it wasn't. Oh, let's do. I mean, in a, in a, everyone is so kind of from the head nowadays. It was about expressing what you just what you felt. Mm -hmm. in, the, in, the same, in the same sort of way? Well, I, I suppose one change is with social media that everyone has this expectancy. It's like going to see a movie. If you've, heard, if you've read the review of it and you're, you're knowledgeable about the director and every part of it, then you go there with, with such a weight on your shoulder of all the knowing you have before you even look at anything. 
So you're not in as a strong position to enjoy yourself. Uh, yeah, and th there wasn't any of that before, and, and that is kind of modern conditioning. But also, and if you're young now, you can choose to just... Well, and I always say this to young people, just go and do your thing. Ignore all the media, ignore what everyone's telling you to do, and just kind of just try and follow your heart and just kind of which is hard because people don't even know what it's saying anymore because they're so uh, analytical and, and everything's so much in the head. And all the enjoyment and the joy of life, that's why, you know, when you see people dancing, just in a room, it can be any dance, you know, it's a, um, the Maypole or barn dance or the Charleston or, you know, whining to reggae or what, it doesn't matter. But you'll see people start smiling. They're enjoying themselves because they stop thinking for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's um, finally there's a lot of I mean, Britain as a place that's gone through enormous change mm -hmm. and has um, and will continue to keep changing in the future. Um, and um, there's a lot of debate about um, where it's going now and what the future will be. And mm -hmm. um, do you do you have an opinion on um, on the changes? Mm -hmm. um, and sort of the future for Brixton? Uh, I always think people spend too much time and energy and concentration on what they don't like about something when they should actually be spending time creating something they like. Because, which is what, with Basement Jacks, that was totally what it was about. I like this. It wasn't fashionable, it wasn't popular. Most people weren't into the music I was into. It was like a scene, but... And then it became fashionable, so I'm lucky in that respect, and I got paid for what I did. But you, you have to kind of do something with the intent of, like, this will be beautiful. So for Brixton, this is how I want to live. This is what I want to do in my life. So create that thing and do it. Don't sit about sit talking and saying, oh, this is no good and that's no good. Just make an action. Make a positive action of what you believe is a, a good way to live. And if you can't do it by yourself, find other people. It doesn't have to be through official channels. You can get to that point, but that might be along the lines. You can do a lot without making it official, I think. I, I, I think looking back, yeah, we all do it, uh, but we all have to be very careful, uh, realising that every history that ever is written is from a perspective, uh, and a, a certain point of view and a certain time. You, I mean... We can talk about the Brixton riots in 96 and, and uh, I witnessed firsthand seeing um, like banks of media and cameras watching one person throw a stone at a window or something. And it was kind of pathetic. It was like a whole bunch of journalists like, like that. And like, oh, he's going to do it in a minute. And, and uh, I mean, it, it's a charade, complete charade. I mean, that... Actually, being in the middle of the riot, I'm not saying all riots are like that. But, and then you watch that on the media and, like, and the, the Daily Mail and, and whatever, and uh, they're like, oh, my God, we're all doomed, and uh, this is, yeah, they're all going to kill us. <laughs> it's, it's just kind of ridiculous. And uh, everything's so sensationalised. So you can read stories from that time, and as far as I was concerned, that wasn't the story at all. So which leads me on to think of any stories throughout history, how can we, we should never take them at face value and realise that that was just one perspective. And often by very privileged people who are kind of looking at somewhere and they weren't even in the real situation anyway. So they're looking from the outside. Um, but the Brixton riot in 96, I remember that evening because I, the, the tube didn't go to Brixton. So I got off at Stockwell and there was this very attractive Brazilian girl so I talked to her all the way back to the, where the riots were happening in the, and the banks of photographers were taking like, a, a few pictures of guys throwing things. And uh, so that was actually the beginning of, of the Brazilian connection with the Basement Jacks. And, and then when we en went on to do Glastonbury and uh, on the main stage, we closed that with the, the Batacada brand that, from that girl that I'd met in the Brixton riots. So something very positive came from that. And... Uh, yeah, and actually I wrote a song called Lonely. <laughs> that was a, a Karina Joseph song. That was right at the beginning of Basement Jacks and Atlantic Jacks. 
because uh, I met her, fell in love with her, and she left for Brazil five days later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was all a liar? Uh, yeah. Or yeah. You feeling lonely? Yeah, 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 yeah. You made me lonely, the song goes, yeah. I don't know. Well, well, friends from London who'd grown up around here were like, Felix, you can't carry on being like you are. You'll get beaten up. You can't say these things. And, and you can't just walk around. You'll get everything nicked. And, and I was fine. Uh, yeah, and I'd walk around at three in the morning and people would come up to you with a limp and kind of like, like this. And I knew how to deal with it. But, it did, but after that, it took me 10 years to get mugged because then I was... <laughs> I was basically, I think, a, a little bit too kind of comfortable with the situation. It was a, that was a, the Telegraph uh, late one night. Um, it had been an amazing party, Basement Jack's party. It was a rooty party, I think. And, uh, and a few people were going somewhere to have a smoke afterwards. And, and I was like, it's so gorgeous. It's like, it's just coming light. I, I'm going to walk home. I had all, like, bags full of banners off the wall and all my records and... And I was just like, yeah, a bit merry and just kind of swaying down the street. And yeah, and then I got, got, <laughs> yeah, I was a, a prime target. So, uh, but also, I don't know, I see that as a, it's a life lesson. I kind of learned from it and how to deal with that. I mean, I've been mugged twice and the second time was like eight kids and uh, they kind of took, my, wrestled my bike off me and ripped all my clothes. And that was hard, but... I also understand that those kids were bored out of their mind and they didn't have anywhere to go. And, and often these things happen on a really hot day. And, uh, and I absolutely forgive them completely. You know, it was kind of, um, don't do it again. <laughs> but you've had that experience. Uh, but I understand where that's coming from because, I mean, I was lucky. I grew up in the countryside. And I, you know, I, I build ramps and climb trees and... You know, I, it took me a lot longer to grow up, probably. But um, I, you have somewhere to express yourself. And I was chopping logs and doing physical stuff. And if you're a, a young teenager, a young male, you, you want to exert yourself and feel you're doing something. And uh, I don't know, just being placated. And, and it really bothered me before with the use uh, on the last sort of riots that happened a few years ago. And shutting of youth centres and activities. It's kind of... Um, I mean, I was talking to my dad about this because he's a, a vicar and uh, he's dealt with young people a lot. And, uh, and I was saying that they need the more physically engaging stuff. And he said, not necessarily. He said it's fine, actually, for young people just to have somewhere to meet and be together. You don't have to always have activities and, and always be like, they must be doing this. Young people can make their fun if they spend time together as well. And they were making fun when they were among me. And, they, and Yeah, I mean, I was a prime target at that occasion. And, um, yeah, so I don't think it's a good thing, but, yeah. But you get it. Yeah, I, I get where they're coming from. And, I, and I, so, in a way, I'm glad I had that experience because I feel I've got a bit more understanding... Of, uh, because I thought a lot about it and it was upsetting and you know it's, um, but if we look at these situations then we can grow as people and yeah you're, I think you're absolutely right that every, everything that happened in history there's no way of being able to say this is exactly what happened and it happened like mm -hmm. this because all the different people that experienced it experienced it in a slightly different way mm -hmm. and you can't really get a full understanding of something yeah so, which is important when you're looking back at uh, Brixton, you're saying these are glimpses of, of, of stories out of so many, many stories. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's always the, the more scary people or the, the more insulting people or uh, the ones that are more extreme, they get noticed. Everyone else is living very normal, regular lives. And when I first moved to Brixton, what I felt in love with was both sides. Yeah, the madness and the extremes was interesting and exciting, but there was a real heart and regular people living out their lives, you know, and um, 
neighbours um, when I first moved who made you feel welcome and chatted to you and said, have a nice day. Which, growing up in the countryside, that's what I was used to. So I just wanted that. And, you, and actually, you rarely get that in a big city, particular, particularly in the, the more affluent areas, where people are so busy being themselves and their important lives that, yeah, all the problems in society come from separation, when you, and, uh, and all our suffering comes from separation. So uh, if you can get rid of that separation, then, then we're all sorted. I, I don't know, when you start doing tables of, of who's got the most connected to their neighbours and then, then you're getting problems with spending all your energy again on, on these little details. But, yeah, in my experience being here, it was, it was a warm, vibey place. And I think that often happens when you get mixed communities as well. Um, and when you get regular people doing regular jobs, you know, it's kind of... Um, I mean, there's definitely plenty of... Uh, you know, old London communities all over London, whether it's east or north or whatever, who, you know, you're, they live with linked to their family and the people around them, but they're Londoners, you know. So um, I, I think often people who come from the outside and, yeah, I, I don't know. It's a, that's a tricky one. But definitely for me, I, I felt, yeah, very welcomed in Brixton and coming from outside in you know in the village where I grew up everyone always said hello to everyone walking past in the street that was normal so it's kind of a I like to find that and when I first came to London I was saying hello to everyone on the tube and I did soon get a bit exhausted exhausting and I understand you know why people did look so miserable but there's a lot of stresses and strains in a big city